It's just, you know, to me, the, the, the memory is just looking at both of their faces. And when you see Pascal, you see Jimmy, just the round face, the round smile, the uh, beautiful smile. So uh, to me, just seeing those two faces together is one of the great things that I like to remember about both of them. Favorite memory of Jimmy is the last one, uh, walking the vineyard and, uh, and talking and... Um, I think he was seriously talking about what the future was going to be himself. Um, as a matter of fact, I think Pascal was with him on that uh, on that walk. So it was uh, that's that's probably one memory. The other memory is that I, uh, what I would would have alluded to a little bit ago, uh, going in to get. Um, uh, an espresso drink at my favorite uh, coffee shop in Portland and Jimmy coming in with Pascal and uh, uh, it being very natural, very, uh, very Portland, very Willamette Valley that you always see each other at watering holes. But for me, it's got to be, so we used to do this harvest party every year. Um, and I think it was just at our house. We cook, like I said, we cooked this animal. We had a lamb and a pig. It's and a pre-harvest, yeah. Pre-harvest party. We'd invite all these interns and whomever. And one year we did it, we roasted this goat, which looks, I got to say, it looks like a dog, sort of, when you're roasting it on a spit. And we had the goat head. And didn't we, like, put it on a stake or something like that? I and Pascal know. was like, ah, you know, and he's wearing all camouflage. And he'd been rolling around playing army in the dust. And um, Jimmy was so proud. You know, say, that's my boy. <laughs> and, and that was that that day um, is definitely uh, uh, yeah high on my um, high on my list. The other one would be: Do you remember when we went mushroom hunting? Did we bring Theo? Yeah, it was we Jimmy had Theo Jason. in a bucket. Yeah, Theo was in a yeah. Our son who's now fifteen. Um, Jimmy was holding in, a, in these plastic, white plastic buckets. We used, you know, five gallon buckets to go mushroom hunting and he had the you know, stuffed in the bucket and was, yeah. and was holding him. Um, can't do that with Theo anymore. No. What's your favorite memory of Jimmy? <laughs> Honestly? <laughs> oh gosh. Um, that I can say on camera? <laughs> You'll, you'll have to work hard to, to top the one that Jim Prosser shared on camera, so. <laughs> I think my very favorite one, certainly one I quote the most, is he walked in here, I think it was in, it was either in 95 or 96, one of the Rainy Vintage. We were here in 95, so. I'm oh, sorry, 96 or, 90, it must have been 97 then. Well, I'll bet it was 97. And he walks in and we had a lot of reduction in the cellar, which nice. smells. I, I was hoping you'd go here. Like. <laughs> If you could say rotten he eggs. Said, he said diapers because he had No, 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 he did. Was, that's not what he said. No, no, he, he walked in the door and he goes, what the hell are you doing here? This place smells like ass. <laughs> <laughs> Which I was telling you earlier in his, in his, his uh, book that, you know, in his lab book, there weren't a lot of comments. But every so often you'd run across and it's like, smells like ass. For me. Smells like ass. I think one of my favorite times with him was uh, was on this panel at IPNC because it was um, it was me and Jimmy and Rob Stewart and Steve Dorner I think was the other one and we were all supposed to present our wines and talk about what we did differently right and this was the 03 vintage um, which was tremendously hot and very strange um, and so it was very atypical and and I just remember Jimmy just being so, you know, we were all trying to kind of put the best face on it as far as like, <laughs> you know, you know, it was a challenging year, that kind of thing that you say when it's really hard. And, <laughs> and he was just so blunt about it, you know, in front of this very formal IPNC crowd and um, basically just said, I didn't know what the hell to do. I didn't know what I was doing. I'd never seen like this, you know, and he was very, very um, real. It was just so real, and um, I really appreciated that because he was just saying what we all felt. It was like, we we just trying everything. We were just throwing stuff at the wall. Uh, and, and and that was kind of how he rolled, you know. He was, he, he at least he gave that impression that he was very laid back. 
um, about it all. And, but when she got to know him, you realize he, he wasn't. He cared deeply. And uh, he, again, he, he, wasn't, he, he, he wasn't as laid back as he tried to show people. But, you know, the other real image and remembrance of Jimmy is just his, you know, at that, at that last party that was so fun when he was making this massive thing of paella, you know, there's just bottles of vodka all over the place. It was just an incredible scene. And it was, um, it was so much him, you know, and he, I think he was in such a happy place because he had this great relationship. Pascal was doing great. And the winery was taken off, and it was all just working. And you could tell he was just happy. He was just a happy, 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 generous guy. Jimmy just loved Pascal. He just really, uh, his life was devoted to Pascal. And, uh, and now looking back, uh, Pascal being a five-year-old kid, I think at the time that Jimmy died, and, you know, he's grown up to be a really uh, wonderful young man and it's just like anytime I look at Pascal Jimmy's picture comes yeah probably I wouldn't be able to single it down to any one moment but I think it's probably just Jimmy sitting at a table smiling what about a memory of Jimmy and Pascal together Um, uh, yeah, uh, Jimmy, uh, gave Paco a lot of war toys, um, which, I, I mean, all little boys want that stuff, right? It's, it's kind of fun, and so, um, Paco had, and I think maybe because Jimmy also wanted to play with them, um, so, you know, Pascal had like really cool tanks that looked like they were real tanks and all these other things. Um, but uh, we went to watch the movie um, Gladiator. Um, and then afterwards, and this is kind of because, and we're probably still this immature because it would be fun, but we all, like we made our own helmets and they had like some pretty wacky helmets in that movie. So we got the tinfoil out and made helmets and weapons and had a gladiator battle. Of course, Paco won, like, and he, sl he slaughtered us. Um, so that was, yeah, it was just silliness, but um, it was silliness in a good way. You know, it's, it's funny, I've, I've thought about that a lot. You know, memories fade after 14 years. It's hard to believe it's been that long since he died. Um, my, my greatest memories of Jimmy were just him just I mean he was such a he was one of those people that you walk into the room and he was there and you like you know you, you just smile you're like oh good Jimmy's here you know so those obviously the paella parties that he threw with fire dancers and you know drinking cold shots of Russian vodka in his refrigerator out of these little thimbles he collected and going mushroom hunting at this special place that a Native American told him never to tell anybody but he told everybody in the valley where it was um, you know driving in his crazy Jeep um, you know all of those things were great memories uh, and and so I don't have just I don't have just one um, it was, just, it was just fun to be around him, uh, to eat with him, to drink with him. To, he, was, he was a funny, fun guy. It's, it's really hard to pick one memory, really. Um, but we used to go, um, this was back when I was a much less busy person, you know? And we used to go mushroom hunting. It was great because like, we were waiting for harvest and it would rain, you know, which doesn't really happen anymore. It never rains anymore. but. Um, Jimmy knew these great, you know, chanterelle areas in the coast range, and we'd go up chanterelling, and we'd pick a five-gallon bucket of chanterelles. It was amazing, and you know, Jimmy would always bring a a rifle with a bayonet on it. <laughs> it's like, what do you have that for? And he's like, oh, the bear poachers. And I'm like, okay. And then actually, one day we saw the bear poachers, and he was like, apparently he was concerned about the dogs that they send after the bears, but. Um, we did once um, run into um, this woman in a pickup truck with about five dogs in the back that looked like they hadn't been fed for like two years, you know. 
Um, and then I understood why he brought that with him. And he used to live down at the coast in Lincoln City. And I think he was at the um, Lighthouse Pub for the McMinimans a billion years ago. And so he got to know some of the guys there and showed him some mushroom places. And I think he learned about all of the stuff from those guys, you know. It's not really what you learn growing up in Raleigh Hills and in the Portland area playing football or whatever he did, you know. Well, I had a really great opportunity. I don't know why particularly, but I just went over to visit at the winery before he had his own. He had been at Masura a little while now. and and. Um, he just was so gracious with his time. I mean, we looked at the whole vineyard. He, we got in his Jeep and we were driving up hillsides that I was afraid to go up or down, you know. And typical Jimmy is just like, go for it. Um, but he took me all over the vineyard and just, um, you know, spent hours with him that day. And I think that's maybe my favorite day uh, with Jimmy was just how, um, generous he was with his time and, and I, I wasn't even there I wasn't shopping for grapes or anything I just said hey how's it you know just kind of showed up and he dropped whatever he was doing and showed me all over the place so um, it made me realize what how generous he was I think you know and before that I it wasn't like I thought he wasn't but I didn't realize that he does that for everybody it wasn't just for me um, and so that was that was a lot of fun but you know there's a lot of memories I mean Riding his motorcycles, and you know, we did some rides together, and being at some of his parties, and um, just uh, he was, to me, he had a little bit of mystery too. You know, his his fascination with the uh, Eastern Bloc countries, and just uh, he seemed like he had a um, he was well versed in stuff that I knew nothing about, and I I, I always admired that he. Uh, he had other hobbies and stuff that were very interesting and gave him a lot of credit for that. So he, he is still missed, you know, but we still have good memories of him. It's hard to imagine, like you said, that it's been so long since he passed away. I mean, I, I have him in bits and pieces. You know, hey, Jim, let's go drink vodka and go beat up some Russians. <laughs> let's, um, and then uh, I remember we were pouring. Actually, the event I met my wife at, Jimmy and I were pouring. It was kind of a, a thing to get younger, a younger demographic for giving and charity. And it was, uh, it, was, it was wine and it was some performance and in this big warehouse space in Portland. And Jimmy and I were, uh, they, they had the, the winemakers kind of set in shifts. And Jimmy and I were behind a bar like this and, and pouring for these people. and. Uh, I think both our biorhythms were on pretty well because there was a lot of uh, good-looking girls that were interested. Some of them, yeah, needed to keep the food table between you and them because there was a little crazy out there as well. Uh, but I actually met my wife that night. Uh, that Jimmy and I got off our pouring hour, hour and a half or whatever, and you know, shooting the shit, and him keep poking me in the ribs, and and uh, and then uh, I ended up. Uh, uh, going out to where the band was playing, the band kind of stopped, and I ended up uh, uh, seeing another friend that came across, and she brought her girlfriend, and talking to another winemaker and me, and they dosey -si doed and I was talking to my wife, and we decided to get a beer the next week, and that was 2000, yeah, it's now 2003, and, uh, and whatever, it's a, it's a done deal now, for a while. Well, one of my favorites, definitely, um, when he came into work one day and, and had found this picture, this Unimog, and was watching a YouTube video of Unimogs, and he was immediately obsessed with, he wanted to find Unimog and find out about how he could get one, and he wanted to know more about him. And I came into work that morning, and he was on, on the internet looking at a picture of one and everything, and he, he, he showed me, and he was so excited and everything. I, I, I looked at him, and I said, well, there's a guy down the street from my house, like a quarter mile, that's got three or four of those out in front of his house, and a whole bunch of He's like, no, not these things. These are like really rare. There's not many of these around. I was like, no, I'm pretty sure there's, there's a whole bunch of them down there. All right, well, at lunchtime, we'll, we'll drive over there and check it out. And so lunchtime, we went back into Sheridan and went over to what is actually Dr. Malloy's house. Um, an old a doctor that's a local doctor there that has an old century farm and sure enough he had four or five Unimogs sitting out front and a couple of Pinsgauers, Halflingers, all these different European military vehicles and so we pulled in, parked and kind of poked around a little bit and finally found Jim 
and started talking with him. And I mean, Jimmy was just so excited. I mean, this was like something he had just just kind of thought about and didn't know how long he would take to finally like get one or find one and everything. And here it was the next day. We got to go out and look at a whole bunch of them. So he, he actually, that's where we got Dirk's phone number, who Jimmy about a year later finally bought a Unimog from.